guitar. Hello! Glad to have you guys join us. Uh, this, my name is Jason Church, and today we're going to talk about the basics for cemetery documentation. And hello to our group in Omaha. We're glad to have you. Glad, uh, sorry we couldn't be there. We're glad to be able to do uh, remote learning with you and be able to present uh, from you know, a quarter way across the country. I'm um, excited about your project. Looking forward to hearing your questions. Uh, as I go along today, we're going to go about an hour. Think about um, things I'm talking about. Think about your own project. Uh, very happy to get your questions at the end and, and be able to help in any way that we can. So to get started, the presentation today is coming from NCPTT. We're the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. We are a cultural research office and training office for the National Park Service. So we don't look at fuzzy bears and, and bald eagles. What we're interested in is the cultural resources. We look at historic buildings, uh, historic landscape, archaeological sites, uh, architectural features, collections, and, and very importantly, at least uh, for me, um, we look at materials research and materials conservation. I'm in the materials conservation program. I'm a materials conservator. Uh, my specialty happens to be historic cemeteries. One of the things that we look at is new treatments, how they interact with historic materials, and also historic materials and historic treatments, how they've decayed and weathered and held up to the test of time, and what we can do for that, how we can repair things, uh, what we can do to try to slow some of the ravages of time. So that's what is important to us and what our research focuses on and what our training focuses on. And I, I think I heard someone mention earlier on the phone bridge that they had been part, it might have been Brian McCutcheon, they had been part of some of our training. So we do training and events like this um, and also hands-on training about historic sculptures and cemeteries and things like that um, throughout the year across the U.S. So today we're going to talk about the importance of cemetery documentation. I don't know what the site that you have looks like, but people do cemetery documentation every day all across the world, and they may come up on a site like this, a site that's derelict, it's been abandoned. Um, you know, really, what are you going to do about this? How do we start? What are we looking at? What are we looking for? You know, what is important to us? And that sort of thing. But also, people do cemetery documentation that come up on pristine sites that have been maintained for their entire history, but no one has ever really stopped to do uh, the documentation to find out who's buried there, um, how their graves are marked, and that sort of thing. So, you know, cemetery documentation can really take any form. So the first of all, what is a cemetery? And in its most essential base definition, a cemetery is a place where we memorialize and honor the departed. So we have to keep that in mind. I mean, you know, the Victorians talk about it being a park-like setting, and I know some places, um, myself included, I got into historic cemeteries as more of a, a sculptural garden, uh, looking at historic sculptures, looking at historic monuments. But one thing we have to think about when we're out there doing our documentation is this is a sacred place, this is a revered place that we are there to memorialize and honor the dead. And we have to really think about that. So that is what a cemetery is. Now, cemetery and graveyard get intermixed a lot. And I believe what you're working at is a cemetery. A graveyard, by definition, is literally that. It's a yard of graves. And they're usually associated with a church or a religious institution. And it's the area that directly surrounds it. it. It is the yard. And that is where also we've, we've marked and memorialized our dead. Um, as we get into documentation, there's lots of different types of documentation you can start with before you even get to the cemetery. And one phase of survey, and this may be important to you because I know you're also very interested in not only the markers and the history, but also the people themselves that are buried there. And that's something we forget a lot about. Uh, myself as a conservator, I think more about the monuments as objects of historical value themselves, but we sort of forget a lot of times about the actual people and their importance and their life and their stories. So I'm excited to hear from Day that um, you guys are working a lot with who are the people. One thing that we take for granted is primary sources. You know, there's a lot of research we can do before we even get to the cemetery. 
um, more famous cemeteries, um, areas of uh, rural, I mean uh, urban areas, might have had postcards that really show the historic landscape, how it's changed, maybe how the plants have changed, and even how the monuments themselves have been moved around and changed over time. Also historic photographs. We don't think about cemeteries now the same way they thought about them 100, um, even 50 years ago. Then they were much more of a place for visitation. A lot of family reunions were held in cemeteries. A lot of um, church events were held in cemeteries, picnics. You know, here we've got a great photograph, a family visiting a grave. And we'll find photographs like that in family collections. And a lot of times they don't even think about it. I myself uh, was doing work in a historic cemetery, was told no historic photographs existed. But I realized the cemetery was just right outside the steps of the church. So I started asking people in the church, you know, does anyone here have wedding photographs of the church? And, you know, everyone went, yeah, but what's that matter? Well, can I see them? And we were actually able to piece together the history of the church over the shoulders of the wedding parties uh, over the years. So there may be pictures that people don't think about. There may be reunion pictures. There may be wedding photographs. Uh, there may be pictures of important events that took place in the cemetery where you can see the surrounding area as well. So that's one type of survey that you can do. Another type of survey you can do is oral interviews. And this isn't something we, we think a lot about, doesn't get done a lot. But there's a lot of information that you can glean from, from people who were active in the cemetery. Maybe the former caretakers of the cemetery, maybe the former gatekeepers, the former sextons but also just elderly people who have unfortunately had to spend a lot of time there, who have had to bury people there, who have been coming there. My photograph here is a great example. This is Chestnut, Louisiana, a little rural community. This is a lady named Miss Bertha Lee. She's in her upper 90s, um, incredible memory, um, you know, really, really on, on task here. We took her out to the cemetery, and she was actually able to tell us who most of the unmarked graves were. She was able to tell us stories about the people, going back, some of them 60, 70, 80 years, and she was actually able to tell us stories about some of the people whose stories had been told to her that had been deceased 80, 100 years from now. She remembered hearing the stories, so was able to tell us about them. And the, the, I showed this photograph, because in the, the forward photograph, we have a field stone. And historically, we think about and we study in history that, you know, field stones were used to mark graves when we didn't have the money for headstones and, and you know, early pioneers and that sort of thing marked field stones. So Miss Bertha Lee started telling me who was buried there. And I said, well, you know, how long were they buried? And that's when I started noticing the outline of the grave where the, gra the grass had not Return and she was explaining that, oh, they've only been buried about five years. What we do is when the next person is buried, we roll that same field stone to the new grave and then we collect money to put a headstone on the last grave. And as best she could figure, that same stone had rolled around that cemetery for about 150 years. So these are great stories we would not have known had we not decided to do some oral interviews. So that's one thing you may consider when doing documentation. So when we're doing documentation, why is this important? Well, one thing is an account of the current condition. A lot of times for grants, uh, for historic register nominations, things like that, they want to know that you've already done the documentation. They want to know what is there, who's buried, how many monuments, how old they are, what type, that sort of thing. So it's important to get an accurate account of the current conditions right from the beginning. And I know a lot of very well-meaning people jump into a cemetery, they start doing work without doing the documentation first, and they'll come back later and say, wow, if you could have only seen what this place looked like when we started. And you, know, you think to yourself, well, I really wish I could see what it looked like before you got started. You know, I wish some um, survey work had been done, some documentation had been done in the very beginning. Another important thing is to record the existing materials. This is really important. A lot of times when you have a historic cemetery that's been abandoned for a long time, it's sort of been forgotten. And when people start revisiting it, they start doing documentation, they start doing cleanup, 
the local newspaper gets involved, you know, school groups get involved, people start talking about it. This is also a high time that you start to see theft. People are remembering the cemetery and they're starting to clear out the weeds, they're starting to get in there. And a lot of times we don't know things have been stolen if we don't know they existed there in the first place. This is a great example. This is a stack of gates that were recovered from the back of a truck. Uh, to take a plea bargain, the thieves admitted they had stolen them from the cemetery and they were returned for, and then they got a lesser sentencing for their crime. Unfortunately, what we don't know is where those gates came from. We didn't have a record, we didn't have any documentation in the cemetery, so when the time came, unfortunately, we couldn't return the gates to where they had properly been, because unfortunately, we didn't have that documentation to begin with. Another thing, reason that documentation is important is to help establish preservation priorities. This helps conservators and preservation people, and also the church or the cemetery or the, the city that runs the cemetery, it helps them establish, oh, well, we look at the documentation, it says here, you know, we figured out 25% of our monuments are fallen, or 30% are leaning, or 70% have significant damage. That's important for them when they're looking for what do we do with the cemetery, you know, how do we uh, move forward. It's important to know some of that. So when we're doing cemetery work, there's lots of survey forms out there. We have some, I believe, on our website. I'd be very happy to send them to you. I'll show you some websites at the end of the presentation that have survey forms on them. Um, there's, so there's a lot available. Not all forms serve all needs, and it's very easy to develop a, a form that for just the things you're looking for. You know, maybe your group isn't as interested in the materials or isn't as interested in the condition as far as is, is it leaning, is it fallen, and you're more just interested in the genealogical information or the iconography on the grave, um, you can very easily make a survey form for that. The important thing about a survey form is you pick your form before you begin and really think about is there things we might want to know later? You know, is there documentation that someone else might want to know later? It's important to do that from the beginning so you don't have to go back and change things or start again or, or make any um, you know, corrections. And it's also important to decide the meaning of all the terms before you begin and train the people involved. And it can be something as, as complicated as what we're doing today with a webinar or as simple as you know, pulling everyone into a room, serving donuts, and talking about you know, what is a pedestal. You know, what is a headstone? Let's talk about some of these basic definitions before everyone goes out and does uh, documentation. I have worked at a site where unfortunately a large group came in, they had these great survey forms, they sent everybody out, and, but they didn't do any pre-training. They didn't talk at all about, you know, what is a ledger. So everyone's definition of even the same monuments differed. So unfortunately in the end, it, it didn't mean a lot because um, everyone had called things differently, they had written down the transcriptions differently. Um, so it's very important to sort of decide what all that is uh, before we get started. And that's, that's what we're going to talk now about is how to accurately record these descriptions. You know, some simple definitions, some simple terminologies that we'll know how to describe uh, the monuments um, that, we're, that we're looking at. You know, how many people describe this differently? Is it a brick tomb? Is it a vault tomb? Is it a ledger cover box tomb? There's lots of different definitions, and they may be all right, or you know, most of them may describe it accurately, but the important thing is to decide how you're going to call it, and stick with that, and tell all the people involved, this is how we're going to call this thing. So we're going to start with, what is a headstone? And it's literally that. It's a stone placed at the head of a grave to mark the deceased. And, and, and that's it in its most basic form. And these can take a wide range of shapes, sizes, colors, materials. You know, it's almost endless. I've said for years, if a material can exist, you'll find it in a cemetery. And that, as a conservator, what challenges me to work in a cemetery. And we'll talk more about materials later. So sort of the basic differences between headstones are those that are ground supported. And now these are, 
some of our earliest headstones, but these were also used every day still. And this means there's no base under there that only the ground itself is holding this headstone up. So this is what we call a ground-supported headstone. And these could go, for example, of our VA marker here with our assistant surgeon. This may go in the ground two feet, three feet. With our slates, I've seen ones that go in the ground another six or eight feet below what we see. So you never know how big these things really are. But these are only supported by the, the earth itself pushed up on it. The second category, and, and the most common that we see, and, and definitely the one we see the most now, is a headstone with stacked bases. And this is kind of important when you're doing descriptions to say, you know, a headstone with three bases, or a headstone with four bases, or one base. And sometimes these sit, just gravity itself holds them on the bases. Sometimes they have metallic pins in them. They might have uh, stainless or bronze, or historically they might have had iron pins that hold them onto that base. Uh, there may be some adhesive between them. Oh, did I have a question there? Nope. The next thing we'll talk about is footstones. And this is exact opposite of that. You have a footstone is literally a small marker at the bottom of the grave. And this is, this is the delineation between the head and the foot of the grave. And that's it. They're usually very small. They could contain the initials. Um, they may contain... Hey, Dave, did I hear you having technical difficulty? Oh, maybe not. Nope. Oh, I heard him say the stream had stopped, but maybe not. Now I don't hear them at all. We'll continue. The next most common type of... Can we check to see if the stream still... Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Dave. All right, the next, and this is really what we see most in modern cemeteries, is what we call a ground tablet. And this is what we see in our modern lawn cemeteries, our big, you know, just fields of, of, of flat markers. And this really came about, unfortunately, for no other reason. It wasn't a style choice. It was it was the advent of the riding mower or the, the powered mower that really made ground grave markers popular. This, this replaced the large uprights for the most reason so that gr ground crews could save money, cemeteries could save money by having mechanized mowers that could drive around and over a lot of markers. So this is what we see now. We think about our bronze markers, but we do have historic ones. We do have granite ones. Uh, there's a nice, like, sort of terrazzo-looking one um, in this picture. And a lot of times, these are very inexpensive markers that then come back. Uh, I think this one's actually in Nebraska. We have a covered wag wagon pioneer. And it's dated 1852, but, you know, this marker is probably five or six years old. You know, it's not from 1852. Um, it's a modern material. It's a modern style. It's a modern font. We know this is uh, less than 10 years old. Another type of grave that we see a lot are ledgers. Now, ledger stones are large, heavy. A lot of times they have a lot of genealogical information on them. They have a lot of information. Um, these are usually supported by a little brick wall, maybe uh, a small concrete foundation. Generally, the body is not laid directly below that. Generally, the body is still a full six feet below that, uh, below that ledger. Uh, that's, that's something I get asked a lot, so I thought I'd cover that. But this is what we call a, a ledger stone. Now, one thing as historians that you're working on and, and doing documentation that you want to look for, and these become very important, are funeral home plaques. Funeral home plaques are made to be temporary. The funeral home does not intend to mark this grave really much longer than it takes the monument company to come out and put a grave. Unfortunately, for lots of reasons, these a lot of times become the permanent marker. As we can see here, the, the gentleman buried, his is dated 1967. So this has been there since 1967, what was intended to stay probably a month or two, you know, at a year at the most. Unfortunately, the next one we see, that's actually a porcelain, and it was written on in a wax crayon. 
it's been there so long it's faded out. We've lost the genealogical information. We don't know who's buried there anymore. These are really important if you're doing documentation. If you see these, make sure you photograph them, make sure you write them down, because the next time the mowers come through or the next time there's a high water, these could be gone and that marker is lost. So it's important to mark uh, these when we see them. Another very common type of grave marker is the obelisk. And the obelisk, think about the Washington Memorial, the Washington Monument. You know, Washington himself isn't buried there. It's a big monument to him. And this is, these are obelisks. This is kind of a holdover from the Egyptian revival craze. Uh, we got really interested, the whole world did, got interested in Egypt and, you know, copying the art of Egypt and things like that around the turn of the century on, really heavy on into the 20s. And this is something, a shape that we got from ancient Egypt that has stayed. We still use obelisks now. They could be, I've seen ones a foot tall up to 20, 30 feet, and of course the Washington Monument. So these are something that we see very common in cemeteries. Another thing, and I know you'll see quite a few of these in your area in Omaha, but the whole Midwest, the whole U.S., we see tree stumps. Now, a lot of times I hear people talk about these as Woodman of the World markers. Now, one thing I want to clarify is they could be or they could not be. The tree stump monument actually predates Woodman of the World. So the tree stump was first, and this signifies, you know, the cutting short of life, the, you know, the end, end of life. You know, it's a tree, it's died, it's, its life's been cut short, and that was significant for, you know, iconography for a cemetery. Up comes the burial insurance company of Woodman of the World, who's now a fraternal organization. They adopted this because, of course, the iconography matched so well with their, their mission, if it is a Woodman of the World marker, it, is, it will always be marked as such. The reason is that you paid a small fee, you got this as part of your burial insurance packet, you got a headstone. If they provided the headstone through your burial insurance, then they always marked it. It was advertising for them. It made the next person at the funeral go, wow, that's a really nice marker he got. I should buy in to Woodman of the World and get a really nice marker myself. So they're always marked. So if they're not marked Woodman of the World, they're not Woodman of the World markers. They're just a tree stump memorial. Um, and that's, that's important when we're doing documentation. Another common grave marker that we see are crosses. It could be stone, wood, iron, bronze. It doesn't matter. We see a lot of crosses uh, throughout the country. Bedsteads. This is really a Victorian idea, and it literally gets the name bedstead because it looks like a bed. You have a headboard and a footboard. You have your side rails. A lot of times you actually had a flower bed in the middle, and this is also important when you're doing documentation. You might want to check back in a couple seasons and, and look to see if any flowers come back up. A lot of times heirloom plants, you know, very old plants that we don't see as much anymore will come back in cemeteries, and a lot of times they'll come back in the middle of these bedsteads where they were originally planted. Another thing that we don't think a lot about, what's very important when we're doing documentation, is not just the headstones, but all the features in the cemetery. And one of those is called cribbing. And cribbing is usually a very short, low-lying material that surrounds the grave itself. Uh, the top photograph, we have some marble cribbing. They do have the initials carved in, some of them even have the full name carved into the cribbing, but usually there's no evidence. It's just, you know, a, a grave marker itself. The lower we have clay tiles that are marking the graves. Unfortunately, we don't have any information on them. There's no name or dates, but they're still very important features. We know that marks a deceased, so we, it's very important when doing documentation to also include things like this, not just the headstones. And of course, the thing that um, brings us to cemeteries a lot of times, the, the, the reason a lot of cemeteries are photographed and visited is the statuary. And this can range from everything. I've seen dogs and, and buildings and miniature trains and toys and statues of the grieving, statues of happy people. It, it really runs the gambit. If it can be carved, you'll, you'll probably find it somewhere in a cemetery. And these are really beautiful and, and very important uh, to the overall look and feel of a site. Another thing, and these are becoming more popular, we really started to see them in the 40s and the 50s, 
and they're really becoming popular now, are benches. And I, I include, I usually don't have a lot of people in my pictures, but I include this bench with people sitting on it because this is the only time when we're in a cemetery it's okay to sit on something. Otherwise, we don't sit on the ledgers, we don't sit on the tombs, we don't sit on the graves. But a bench, a bench is a bench. It's there for a reason. They've chosen this, the family or the deceased themselves have chosen for whatever reason to have their grave marked with a bench for a reason. Feel free to sit on it. It's part of the landscape. Uh, it's an important feature. The next thing you may or may not see are mausoleums. And mausoleum is a building that contains the deceased. So these are usually above ground. They may be huge. I've been in mausoleums that were three stories tall with thousands of graves in them. So they may be small buildings. They may be very large buildings. But the, the deceased are in coffins, inside the little side wings on this Egyptian revival. And you can see an interior photograph. And then they have a stone that covers them. Um, typically, a lot of vandalism happens. People break in the mausoleums, hoping to, to, to see deceased. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate that they've done the damage for nothing. Most of the time, they're still behind another uh, stone or brick wall. But a mausoleum is that. It's a, it's a house for the dead. Vaults could be above ground, they could be below ground, but you have this, you know, sort of square, rectangular shape that usually, and this is important, does not contain the dead. Of the vaults that you see here, only one of them is an actual burial vault. The blue one in the bottom is a burial vault. Most of the time, these people are six feet under, this vault is constructed on top of the ground as solely a representation, uh, a small tomb, a memorial, and you don't see people actually buried in them. A lot of vandalism that we see is people bust the ledgers off, they bust the sidewalls out, hoping to see the bodies, and they're, they're not there. They're still six feet below. It's very rare that a body is actually inside a vault. And the last thing that we, you might see, uh, as far as architectural, are crypts. And crypts are sort of the difference between mausoleums and, and, and vaults. A crypt is a building that contains the deceased underground. So you might have a very elaborate top side, but typically these are subterranean. These are crypts. These, the burials are actually below ground. And sometimes you don't even know they're there. You might see a vent or um, glass pieces on the, the surface that, light, that allow light to get down into the crypt. Uh, as you can see in these photographs, these are the shelves underground inside this crypt. This crypt happens to be empty uh, that contains uh, the deceased. Materials. Materials, as I said before, can run the gambit. We have, a, we have a wooden grave marker here. It has paint. It has little metal uh, letters, uh, nail to it. There is really, if it can exist, you'll find it in a cemetery. And this is important when you start doing preservation. What kind of materials you have. It's also important in documentation when you're writing down, we've talked about the types of headstones. We have a ground supported grave. We have a, a, a um, um, tree stump marker here. We have a based uh, headstone. What are their materials? They kind of look all the same, but they're not. We have marble, limestone, concrete, and zinc. So the range of materials also is important for us to talk about. The most common that we're going to see in historic cemeteries is marble. And marble can be some of the most beautiful sculptural things down to the most simplistic of graves. It can be bright white. It can be very gray, like our Thomas grave here. That, that's a, a, Vermont, grand, a Vermont marble. It's a very gray. And gray is a, I mean, marble is a metamorphic stone. So this is important for us as conservators. We look at all these different crystalline structures and how they interact and how chemicals um, harm these. And this is how marble weathers. And it's very grainy and sugary. is because we lose the grain boundaries between these little crystals, and they start to come apart. And that's important as things age and weather. Limestone is our sedimentary material. This is what um, you know, marble is going to turn. Limestone will turn into marble in, in time, you know, another million years or whatever the time scale is. Sorry, I know that. What we have with limestone is a lot of early markers 
limestone is very soft materials, easily carved. So a lot of pioneer markers, a lot of early markers are just beautifully carved, very artistic limestone. And we sort of forget about limestone a lot. And here's our, our uh, up close of our sedimentary rock. A lot of times we'll have little fossils embedded in those. Granite. Granite's really important. Ninety-some percent of all monuments made now are granite. Granite comes in just about any color of the rainbow. You can see some really beautiful blue granite that's starting to come out. We think more typically of our gray granite here. We definitely have carvings. When we have carvings like this, they're much more modern. Historically, we didn't have a lot of granite because in the cemeteries because we had to wait for technology to catch up. We had to wait for pneumatic drills, pneumatic chisels, uh, diamond impregnated bits, things like that, for us to actually be able to, to work granite. It's just too hard of a material. So historically, we won't see a lot of granite in cemeteries. And granite's our igneous rock. Uh, it's very strong. Um, and that's really the reason that it's used so much now, because it lasts for so long. Another thing, you probably won't see it out in Omaha, but thought I'd throw it in here, because it's definitely uh, one of the most beautiful and important materials, and that's slate. Slate's a sedimentary rock. It can be beautifully carved. It lasts very, very long times. You will see slates from the 17. 1600s, this the one here is 1737, it still is beautiful, it hasn't really weathered, it really hasn't aged like our marble does. Um, you probably won't see slate that far Midwest, but you could. Every once in a while a New Englander would have a, a slate shipped out to him to mark the grave. Sandstone is a fantastic material, we've got another sedimentary rock here. Sandstone can be very buff color, it can get very red, very brown. Um, easily carved, doesn't weather that well, unfortunately. And a lot of times these are sandstones were found locally and carved in very vernacular uh, local styles. One of my favorite is concrete. Concrete can be formed to look like the most exquisite of carved marble, but it can also really show us the hand of the loved one. You know, someone. It, it takes one thing to go and, and place an order for a monument. It takes another to actually carve out and make your own for the deceased. So this really puts us a direct connection between that marker and the family or and the loved ones. So a lot of times we'll have very um, homemade looking markers, um, very important. A lot of times they're overlooked because they don't have the artistry or, or the high-endness of some of the marbles and slates, but very, very important markers. Bronzes, um, we see them now a lot in our flat ledger markers. Um, a lot of times they can be brown or gold or um, weathered to the green color. Another thing that you might see that's, that's very important that we don't see a lot of, but I do know I photographed a few out your way, are zinc monuments. And zinc, we're, con we're call also called white bronze. And these are cast metals, they're hollow, uh, they're thin cast. They weather beautifully. You can get a lot of really great detail in them. They weren't made for that long. They were made by the same companies. Uh, they had different branches around the U.S. Uh, a lot of them came out of the Midwest. A lot of them came out of the Chicago and Illinois area. You really see the decline in the 20s. So for, for a period from about 1900 to the late 20s, you, you'll see zinc markers. Um, so when we start talking about documentation, we've talked a little bit about how to describe this headstone, what it's made out of. So we have a, a headstone with one base, and we have a concrete marker here. How do we write down the transcription? How do we find out for the next person how to write down who Lewis Hamilton was? Something we also want to look at in our description, and of course a lot of this will be in our photographs, and we'll talk about that in a second, is that there was paint on this. It looks like it was painted white. We have some green in the flowers. There may have been other colors. We don't see them anymore, so we can't really write that down because we can only write down what we can see right now. We can't infer information. We can't, well, we, we think it had yellow on it or something like that. We have to only write down what we can witness. And a lot of times, this is what people will write. We got Lewis Hamilton when he born and when he died. It's not really for as historians doing proper documentation, we really need to look at 
what the headstone really says. If it's written in capital letters, we need to write it in capital letters. If it has misspelled words, we need to keep it misspelled. And how we di differentiate the one sentence to a next is we put our backslash. So Lewis H. Hamilton, that's the first line, backslash. The next line, backslash. So even though we may not write it in this order on our documentation form, we may write it all out, we'll know the break between the lines with our backslash. So it's very important to write it this way. It's what's considered the, the proper documentation so that we can tell what line everything's on. And like I said, if it's, if it's a capital letter, keep it a capital. If it's a lowercase, keep it a lowercase. A lot of times, and we're, we're back to my favorite, our, my concrete markers here, a lot of times these are very vernacular. When I say vernacular, they're of the people. They're, they're made by hand, you know, maybe by someone who wasn't a professional. Maybe it's made by the family member themselves. Um, there may be misspellings. These are important to the history of that, mark, that monument. These are important in your documentation. So you want to keep that misspelling. And there's a couple, here's two different ways to write it. You could actually have abbreviations that say backward. Sometimes that gets a little jumbled. I prefer the second way, which is we have a little asterisk there. And at the bottom of our survey form or at the bottom of our, of our documentation, we have our little asterisk that says, you know, it, this indicates a backward letter. And you may have a lot. Another thing, we've talked a little bit about materials and the type and how to write down the transcription. Another thing we want to look at is the iconography. These little symbols are put on the headstone for a reason. They tell us more about that person. This gentleman's name was Jim Davis, so we know his name, we know his wife's name, we know when they were buried, and we know when he died. That's great, but we also know by looking at these, he was a member of the Elks Club. He was a member of the Knights of Pythias. He was a member of the Masonic Order. So these are all important things that tell us, you know, this person was really a pillar in their community. They were a member of three of the most important fraternal groups in his town. That really puts them as being, you know, very influential and very important in their community. Another little thing, if, if you can make it out, I hope you can, the small photograph in the center lower, that's the signature of the carver. So Mr. Davis not only was very important in his community, but he was also influential enough, financially set enough, to be able to go out and hire a very famous carver to come and carve his, his grave marker. So that tells us more and more about the person and how they lived and what they did. And in doing the little research, I actually found out Mr. Davis owned a very large trucking company. Uh, he was a freed slave who bought a single truck. Uh, it was actually a... a a wagon train at the time, and actually by the 19 teens, he actually owned about 15 trucks, like actual vehicular uh, building by the by the late teens. So this is someone who became very influential in his community. Here I've listed a fantastic book. Uh, I don't have enough time to go th over all of the iconography that you'll see and what those things mean. But Stories in Stone, A Field Guide of Cemetery Symbolism and Iconography by Doug Hester. It's a fabulous book. I definitely recommend uh, the class buy it. It's not a very expensive book. If, if you're going to be doing this a lot, I'd get my own. Um, what this goes is goes through all of the different, the Knights of Pythias. Who were they? When were they, they active? Um, in the middle, we have the Boy Scouts. Over here we have GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. This is a, a veterans group for soldiers who fought for the North in the Civil War. These are all important things that tell us about that person outside of just the information that's on the headstone. This gives us more information about how they lived, and maybe what they did, and, and um, what they were interested in. All right, so maps. Maps are really good when we're doing documentation. <coughs> Excuse me. It really helps us locate what we're talking about. There's several electronic programs now available online. Um, there's free downloadable map software you can get. Um, you can get as, as you know, as expert as getting GPS and GIS. A lot of uh, camera phones and a lot of cameras now will do GPS data on your photographs 
those are very useful. Another thing, though, you don't have to get that high tech. You don't have to go out, buy equipment, learn software. I've seen some great work done where they just put out stakes, they ran surveyor's tape in a 10-foot grid, and they put in, I worked at one site, they had a fence around the site. They actually took Dixie cups, paper cups, and made giant letters every 10 feet along the fence line. One side was all letters, one side was all numbers, and then they assigned people, you have a 10 block, and you would go out to the square marked out with surveyor's tape that became A10, and your job was just to document and draw what was in that. And then when it was all said and done, they put them all together, and they had a gridded map of the entire site. Didn't cost them any money, didn't cost them, you know, no one had to learn a different software or learn GPS. They were actually able to map the entire site by just drawing out on grid what they had. The importance of a map is to locate our graves, to locate what we're talking about. So when we start talking about, oh, the grave of Jim Davis, oh, well, he's, he's number 540 in block A. Um, not always as important, not always as high tech as that. Photo doc documentation, this is really important. This is, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, you know, by all means, take as many pictures as you can. It's really important to get one good frontal photograph. You see the young lady here, she's taking a photograph, she's got her board out, tells the grave number, tells the site, all her information is saved there. And then we go around and we take close-ups, we take back pictures, we take far away pictures to show us where that grave is in conjunction with other ones. So with, with now with digital cameras, there's no reason we can't take you know, 5, 10, 15 uh, pictures of each site, of each grave. And another important thing when we're doing that, when we're all said and done with this, share the pictures. You know, when you do your documentation, don't just keep it as your class project. Don't keep it as your club project. Take those pictures, print them out. You can just print them on regular paper if you want. Staple the whole thing together. Give it to your local library. Give it to the genealogy group. Give it to you know, your state archives. Pass that information around. You've done a lot of work. You've gathered a lot of information. Don't hold it as your own. Pass it around. Let other people know it's out there. There's a lot of photographic tips that you'll see on the internet. The ones we're going to talk a little bit about what don't, not to use and then what you should use. Never use shaving cream, flour, or chalk. These are the most common that you'll see recommended on the internet. They're all bad for the stones. In the lower photograph, the smaller photograph, what you'll see is this is what shaving cream is. Basically, you take shaving cream, you spray it on, you take a squeegee just like you have at the gas station to wash your windows, and you rub it down the front of the grave, and it leaves the white shaving cream to highlight all the letters. Unfortunately, what that does is now you've left, even if you rinse it, it gets absorbed into the stone, marble especially, limestone, sandstones, they're very absorbent. They suck in this material. If you look at shaving cream, you look at the direction, the ingredients on the back, lotions, oils, soaps, these are all things that are sticky. They then stay on the headstone and every time the wind blows, pollen, soot, uh, seeds, everything gets stuck to the surface. And then that becomes a great just smorgasbord for biological growth. So what we can see in the larger photograph is where a very well-meaning uh, geologist has come by, they've sprayed shaving cream, they've squeegeed it off, they've taken their pictures, they've written it down, and even if they rinsed it, the stickiness, the shaving cream has still get, been absorbed into it, and then what you have is a great just food bed for biological growth to come back. Same with flour, does the same thing. What we do recommend, and it's very easy to do, it can be done with just one person, it can be done easily in a group of people, is photo reflectors. Now these can be expensive ones you can order online, or I myself use a white one and a silver one that are made to block the sun from your car windshield. Cost about $10 at your big box stores. So it doesn't have to be expensive. I know a lot of people that bring out uh, closet mirrors, you know, the inexpensive mirrors that you can get to hang on the back of your closet. Those work really well. And all you're doing is you're reflecting light back 
from the sun onto the headstone to give it more light. Uh, a nice raking light at about 20 degrees works really well. This really highlights the text and then you have your photograph. If you're working by yourself, set up a tripod, set your timer for 10 seconds, get it where you like it, it'll take the picture. I've done that plenty of times myself, works really well. If you have a really stubborn inscription that you can't read, a flashlight works really well laid at an angle. We were having trouble reading that last word, it ended up being you know, her. We could lay the flashlight even in the daytime. It works better if it's a, if it's a cloudy day or, or getting dusk. That raking light really highlights those letters, really lets us take a photograph, lets us write that down. Um, and of course, there's a lot of things you can do with Photoshop, uh, playing around with the photos you took to try to get that, that what we thought was lost inscription. And these are great things to involve the community, uh, you yourselves, uh, getting friends to come out, getting family members to come out, uh, to help take these photographs and write these descriptions. Another thing in documentation that we want to think about is, we've talked about the materials, and we've talked about the inscriptions. Another just small thing that gets overlooked a lot, especially in uh, rural cemeteries, is color. Color is important. We don't think about color a lot, but a lot, in the past, cemeteries were brighter places. They had more color, they had more decoration to them. Um, we see Miss Bradley here in the, the upper, smaller photograph. Her epitaph is painted on. So we've, we've painted some white, uh, it's actually been spray painted, and then black lettering is done. That's really important in documentation to write down, this is a painted epitaph. And the epitaph, I, I don't know if I covered this, the epitaph is those written words. The epitaph is the information written on the grave marker. It's important to note this is a painted epitaph so that if your survey survives, someone finds it in a local genealogical library, they look through it and they say, oh, well, you know, Miss Bradley had a concrete cross and this is about, you know, northwest corner of the cemetery, this is about where she should be, we can't find her. They can look on there and say, oh, well, it was a painted epitaph. Oh, well, that's been 15 years. It's been five years. The paint's gone. This concrete cross over here is probably Miss Bradley, and the painted epitaph is gone. So that's important to note. One thing also is just because you couldn't afford a really well expensive carved you know, granite or marble headstone and someone might have gone with a lesser expensive concrete marker didn't necessarily mean they wanted it to look like a concrete marker. A lot of times concrete markers were painted. They were painted white. They may have been painted gray. They may have been faux finished to have speckles in them to make them look like granite or look like uh, a buff color like limestone. So that's important. A lot of times that's worn off. That's worn away. To look at around the cracks in the letterings to note that this was once painted. If you see pieces of paint, write them down. That tells us more of the history of the marker that is going to be lost. Another thing that we look at in documentation, we've got our overgrown cemetery here. A lot of times this is the best time to do documentation. Because one thing that we don't think about a lot, sometimes plants are the grave markers themselves. Here we have a type of tea rose planted. It looks like this just brown, scraggly little plant. I would have totally mowed over myself. When we come back out in the springtime, this thing's in full bloom. It's bright red little tea flowers, little tea roses, beautiful plant. I would never have considered that a grave marker had I not found one that still had, or several, that still had the temporary funeral home marker in front of them. And then you start noticing, well, gee, all the rose plants in here these scraggly, ugly little tea flowers, they're in rows. They're about the length of graves. That's when you start, oh gosh, you know, maybe the plants themselves. Plants have been used for grave markers forever. Um, sometimes they were meant to be temporary, sometimes they were meant to be permanent. Here we have two uh, flowering bushes, both have temporary markers in their bases. These were planted, these now become as important as a marble headstone. These are marking the dead, and we need to document them just the same. Another thing you may run across in your cemetery is what we call unconventional grave markers. They're still there, they're still meant to honor the dead, they're still as important as anything, they still need to be documented. Um, 
the one at the bottom, the field stone, a lot of times we talked about the story of Miss Bertha Lee. You may have field stones that mark it. Uh, my favorite here is the tractor axle. Uh, I actually did an oral interview and asked about this. A lot of people think, oh, well, somebody threw some junk out in the cemetery. And the family member actually said, oh, well, we couldn't afford a headstone. We actually went and got a, an axle off a Ford tractor that was in dad's shop, and we buried it here as his grave marker. He would have liked that. So sometimes unconventional grave markers are definitely as important as the conventional, as the really high-end grave markers. Another thing that you'll run across is what we call grave goods. These are things left by the, by the family members of the deceased. Um, sometimes they are garbage. A lot of times they're not. They're what we call grave goods. So you might have broken crockery. You might have, I've seen broken clocks. I've seen broken pieces of furniture. Definitely toys, momentum's left, uh, money. In my opinion, this is all part of the grieving process. This adds to the character of the cemetery. We photograph it, we make a footnote in our documentation that it contained it, and we move on. Another thing that gets overlooked a lot is fencing. Fencing and furniture. A lot of times we're very really focused on the grave markers themselves. We think about the headstone, we think about the footstone, and what contains our epitaph and our information. But one thing we might also want to consider is when you're doing your documentation, are there fences around? Are the fences still there? Photograph them, write them down. Now I know one thing our, our group here in Omaha is interested in is who are these people? Now this isn't something I do a lot myself, so I'm definitely not the expert at it. Um, some guidance I can give you and it is where to look for finding out more information about the graves that you're looking at, the people. Rootsweb.com is a great resource. Um, it's a, it's a user-friendly resource that people constantly add more information to. So it's being updated you know, as we speak. People are adding different records, different genealogical information that they're gathering themselves, photographs. Um, you know, newspaper articles about Please different people. pardon the interruption. Your conference contains less than three participants at this time. Oop. If you would like to continue, press star one now. Or the... All right. Keeping you on. Things to look at. There's also a great book called Your Guide to Cemetery Research um, by Sharon Carmack. It's a great uh, resource book. It has a lot of information in it as well about not only things I've talked about in documentation, but also, you know, how do we look up the people? And some of the tips I can give you is, you know, census records. Uh, the U.S. census records are all online now, so we can look up the people that way. We know, of course, where they lived, at least when they died, because they're buried there. City directory. These eventually morphed into phone directories. But before we had phones, we still had city directories. So you can go to your local library, historical society, and look for city directories. And a lot of times, not only will it tell us the person's name, it may tell us who was in their household. That's important for us. It will tell us where they lived, somewhat important. But most importantly, a lot of times, the city directories list their occupation, which is important when we're looking up the history of these people. Another thing we can look at is court records. And court records may contain uh, death certificates. They may contain. Um, marriage certificates, some court records will contain baptism certificates, christening certificates, but also when they bought property, um, a lot of times their state records are there. So it may tell us about not only how they lived, and where they lived, and what they did, it may tell us who was connected with them. Um, you know, maybe they'll have criminal records even, and that'll tell us, you know, how they lived and what kind of person they were. Church records are good. A lot of times uh, marriage and, and birth and death information uh, is all contained in church records. They're a little harder because, of course, if you're at a public cemetery or a city-owned cemetery, you don't really know, you know what church they attended or if they did. So those records are hard to get unless you're working with a church cemetery. Also, death records. Death records are really interesting. A lot of times, uh, the cemetery itself will have a record. The death record will tell a lot of times where the person lived, how old they were, if they knew that. Um, sometimes it'll tell the occupation, but it'll also tell how they died a lot of times. Uh, it'll tell if they came from the hospital, or if they came from a funeral home, or if they came from you know, an accident. I've 
done research with death records and it'll say ship accident, you know, sent here directly from the ports, you know, explosion on, you know, and they'll list the ship's name even. So a lot of times there's more information in the death records and in the, the cemetery's ledgers than we really think about. Now I know I talked to Day a little bit and she said you weren't planning to do much or any of cemetery care, but what we're going to do now is just, just a very quick little little uh, snippet about cemetery care, a little, I think it's about five or six minute video, give us a little break, be thinking about your questions, when we come back we're going to have question and answer time. I know right now you're more interested in the documentation, but a lot of times the groups I've worked with over the years, um, people do so much work with the documentation in the end, they kind of want to spruce up the people they've, they've become to know. You know, you, you really get to know these people in a way by doing the documentation. So we're going to queue up a, a short video and, and cover just the real basics of uh, cemetery cleaning. Hello. In this video, we'll be showing you the basic procedures for cleaning a stone grave marker. There are two things to remember. First, is always exercise personal safety. And the second is to do no harm to the grave marker itself. Stone is a very durable material. However, keep in mind that stone can be affected by pollution and weathering over its lifetime. So exercise caution before proceeding with any treatments. Now before we get started, let's briefly go over what not to do. We don't want to do anything that will remove or damage the original surface of the stone. We never recommend the use of bleach or other salt-laden cleaners. It is also never advisable to use any strong acids or bases. Finally, we don't want to use any harsh mechanical devices such as sandblasting, high pressure power washers, or power tools such as grinders or drills equipped with wire brushes. All of these methods can damage the grave marker. Let's look at some damage that has resulted from well-intending people cleaning with poor techniques. Okay, so now that we know what to avoid, let's get started and set down the ground rules for how to proceed. In keeping with our do no harm policy, it's important to select the gentlest cleaning method possible to accomplish your task. The first thing we need is to select our tools before we proceed with the cleaning instructions. Always locate your nearest water supply. It takes a lot of water to properly clean stone. If your cemetery does not have running water, it is important to bring barreled or bucketed water to the site with you. Also, it is good to have your selected cleaner in a convenient spray bottle. As for the brushes, you always want to use soft bristle, either a natural or a synthetic. The general guideline is that if your brush is safe for cleaning the hood of your car, then it will work well for historic stone. For chemical cleaning, acceptable products are non-ionic detergents, solvents, surfactants, biocides, and intermediate water misting. When looking for the right type of cleaning product to use, try to find a non-ionic detergent or a product containing biocide with either a neutral pH or a pH similar to that of the stone you're cleaning. We can learn more about the cleaners by reading the product literature and the material safety data sheets. All right, so let's get started. In keeping with our do no harm policy, we're going to make some small tests to assure we're not going to damage the stone. We have evaluated the selected cleaners and we like the properties of this particular one for this stone. There doesn't appear to be any damage caused by the cleaner and the appearance is satisfactory, so we're good to continue. 
Now we're going to want to soak the stone before we begin. Stone is a very porous material and will quickly absorb any cleaner that is applied to it. By soaking the stone first, it allows the cleaner to stay on the surface of the stone. This minimizes the impact of the stone and maximizes the cleaner's effects. Once it's wet, we start cleaning from the bottom and slowly work our way up to the top. Starting from the bottom of the stone minimizes streaking and staining. We're going to want to use small circular motions as we go. This helps to get in all of the crevices. Sometimes it's important to switch brushes to meet the situation. On stones with a lot of biological growth or heavy soiling, you may need to repeat the cleaning methods more than once. If you are using a cleaner that contains a biocide, keep in mind that the stone will continue to lighten over the next few days. Also, as we said before, we're going to use a lot of water. Make sure you keep the stone rinsed at all times. And there you have it. These procedures are not only useful for general cleaning, but can also be performed before more complicated repairs or conservation work takes place. Now that we've finished cleaning this headstone, we've allowed it to dry overnight to show that it will lighten when it's dry. On this particular grave marker, we've used a biocidal cleaner that will continue to lighten over the next few days. Now that you've watched this video on the basic procedures for cleaning a stone grave marker, remember, always exercise personal safety and to do no harm to the marker itself. And good luck. Well, we are back, and that was the conclusion of our talk. So, Day, I'm interested in what your students, um, what questions they have. I'm happy to to answer anything that you have and just feel free to, to talk up. So who has the first question? All right, my first question is from Joe, and the, the, the question is, have I ever cleaned a gravestone? And the answer to that is yes. Um, I'll be honest, it's not my favorite thing. I'd much rather fix one than, than clean it, but I have cleaned, it, it would be in the hundreds um, all across the state, country. I think I've, I've cleaned in about 20 states now um, across, and, and across the country. So yeah, I've... Fortunately or unfortunately, clean hundreds of gravestones, everything from little footstones to full mausoleums. So, and it's 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 different every time. So, what's what's our next question? Oh, so Day, who who has another question for us? Yes. There's a bit of a delay. Yes. If you talk, it, it goes on the phone, and then it starts while you're talking on the phone to the camera. Oh, okay. Well, the, the delay on the camera is only the Ustream, not what I'm actually hearing. So you guys are welcome to go ahead, as soon as you hear me on the phone, start asking the next question. Yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead and mute the video and then and then uh, you can just talk to me directly. Okay, next question. What's your name? Austin has the next question. All right, Austin, what's your question? How long have you been cleaning gravestones? 
how long have I been cleaning the gravestones? Um, to be honest, Austin, my first project was in third grade. Um, my North Carolina history class in third grade, Miss Lucas's class in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, I did a video documentation tour of the cemetery and got to be friends with the caretaker and did cleaning there. And then my Cub Scout group went out to the cemetery uh, because of that connection. We did cleaning. And I pretty much have done it off and on ever since. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I did a lot of research in cemeteries and started doing work there. And I've been with the Park Service now seven years in this position teaching people uh, how to clean and, and teaching classes and, and talks like this on um, how to do cleaning. So uh, a, a long time then. Before he's a teacher of the class. Okay, Barry, what's your class? What's your question? Uh, we've got a lot of uh, damage in the in the, the cemetery that we're working on. What advice do you have for uh, resetting uh, headstones? Okay, um, depending on the size of the headstone, headstones can be. Uh, the question that Barry had was, um, what advice do we have on resetting headstones? If you go to our website, the, the route here at NCPT, and search for um, resetting, we actually have two series of videos on the basics for, for resetting headstones that may be a benefit to you. Depending on the size and the complexity, uh, resetting is something that can be done fairly easily. Um, it's inexpensive, and it really makes a big impact difference in the cemetery. Um, you know, just getting them off the ground, you know, getting them... Uh, back up in the air is a big difference. A lot of times, if if you have a lot to reset, this is a good thing to maybe get a local monument builder involved, uh, go talk to them and say, hey, you know, we're doing this volunteer project, we're trying to adopt this cemetery, we're working here, what help can you provide in some of the larger ones, or can you come out and talk to us about how to reset some of the smaller ones even? Um, but a lot of times, the monuments are, a lot of them, that are on stacked bases are held together with gravity. So those are e things we can easily, you know, wipe them down, you know, dust them off and, and stand them back up, especially the small ones. And a lot of times the smaller ones are what have been knocked over by just wind, falling debris, or careless vandalism over the years. Um, so I think if it's small ones that you can manage, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great idea. And, and I'd be happy if you guys wanted to get into resetting uh, to, to give you another talk. We have, like I said, we have some videos, and I think even um, a recorded uh, webinar about resetting on our website. Uh, but I'd be really happy to help you guys uh, with any tips or sort of instruction on, on how to reset. So, what, what other questions we have? Okay, McKenna. So McKenna's question and comment was they have, in their site, they have you have headstones that the inscription is completely eroded away. Unfortunately, this is, this is something that we have to deal with. This is sort of the unfortunate thing with the ravages of time. You know, a lot of these materials, even though they're, they're stone and they're hard, you know, they've still been pulled out of the earth and, and beaten and carved and carted around, and they're, they're fragile. And a lot of times they do... They have weathered, um, unfortunately, beyond. If we know without a doubt what was written there and who's buried there, if we have records, maybe photographs or documentation of what was said, we can always make a small memorial plaque with the inscription on it to be placed on the ground in front of the gravestone. I don't recommend attaching anything to the original gravestone. Um, I definitely don't recommend recarving the gravestone. Because in doing that, we really alter the historic fabric of the site. We start to change how it looks. We start to change, um, you know, the, the the original character of it. But if we do know what was there, a lot of times I've seen small aluminum plaques or small bronze plaques or even small concrete markers made. You know, a, a, a small little thing that could be laid on the ground right in front of the headstone. 
if it's already worn, there's nothing we can do to recapture that. We can't, you know, do some kind of special cleaning or scanning and get that information back. When it's gone, it's gone. It's worn off. We have to respect the ravages of time that has, has taken that. Um, there are treatments that conservators can do to help slow the deterioration, especially of marbles, um, but there's nothing we can do to, to, to back that up, and there's not much we can do on an on a everyday level to try to get that back. Um, you know, best we can do is try to document the way it is now, you know, doing some light techniques, things like that, to try to see what, what little bit le that might be left. Um, there's not a lot we can do um, to, to transcribe that, and there's nothing we can do to bring that information back. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Any other questions? And while the next person's thinking about their question, coming up to the mic, uh, I've got a slide here, to just some places you can get more information about, and I'll leave that up while I'm talking for the next question, but um, Texas Historic Commission, our website, Association of Gravestone Studies, the Chikora Foundation, they're all really good websites that have more information about documentation, history, iconography, um, cleaning, care, all kinds of things, uh, resetting, uh, that your, your class can use. So, do we have another question? I have a question just before the next question. Will this be, will they be able to hook to this website and watch this video again or look at the slides? Yes, they will be. Um, we've recorded our webinar and we'll have that up. Um, the video that you saw is up all the time. We have a whole series of videos on cemetery care that are up. We have a, a cemetery uh, link on our website that has more information and stuff like that. And also at the end, I will send you, I will, the last slide I'll show you in a minute um, is my contact information. And I'm more than happy if any of the students have questions, uh, they can contact me, they can email me questions, you know, send me a picture, you know, how, what, what can I do about this or what, what do you call this? I, I'm happy to, to, to help in that respect as well. But yeah, we will post this uh, webinar back up as a video that can be watched later. Sure. Joe's question was, have I or myself, I myself or, or known other people who have found hidden graves in the cemetery? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> it happens a lot, a lot more than you think, actually. It doesn't take that much for a headstone to fall, or maybe there was no headstone there ever. Or maybe it was a wooden grave marker that deteriorated, uh, maybe it was stolen, maybe it fell, and it's just been covered over by wind and rain, and it's just a few inches below ground. Um, sure, we found, you know, whole cemeteries that no one even knew was there when the road crew hit them, or an archaeologist was looking into a site and did a, a, a test pit or a shovel pit and found, oh my gosh, you know, we, we've hit grave hardware or we've hit bones. I myself have gone to work in cemeteries, and a lot of times we'll use a thin metal rod about seven or eight feet um, to probe in the ground to look for graves, to look for artifacts. And I found, you know, headstones. We found whole sections that have just slowly been encroached upon by the woods, where once going back and really raking back and even doing a little bit of shovel work, we start to find headstones that were have just been covered over by years of, you know, leaves falling and, and mounding up sort of thing. So, yeah, unfortunately, we find uh, unmarked graves and we find, you know, lost uh, graves quite often. And it's an unfortunate thing. That means we've... You know, there's been a lapse in care long enough uh, and in memory for these to, to be lost. So. And maybe it would be good for you guys to just tell him a little bit about your project so he can know before Yeah, I'd love to hear more about your project you're doing. I uh, will. My question was uh, my name's Andrew. Um, Mr. Jurgensen has talked to us a little bit about your work in Hawaii. With uh, one great I Lever Colony. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how that turned out and everything? Oh, okay. Uh, so Andrew's question was about um, 
the Park Service's site at Kalapapa in Hawaii. I myself haven't been out there to work. Um, I know some of the workers, uh, some of the masons at HPTC, the Historic Preservation Training Center, in Frederick, Maryland, who have been out there doing the work. Um, my supervisor, Dr. Striegel, has been out there to do some work. Uh, a lot of work was done by Gretchen Vakes, um, an archaeologist and conservator uh, in, the, in, the, in the West. What we have there, we have, as you said, it's a leprosy colony. It's now, it's now a Hansen's disease site, is, is what it's, it's termed. This was a site, and residents still live on site. Uh, there's still plenty of people living that, that were interned on this site. Uh, the Park Service owns the land now, but um, with the arrangement that they still, uh, the people still control it, who are the, the patients there, the residents there. And uh, the cemeteries for them are very important because, you know, all of their friends who have been there and, and then themselves, of course, are going to end up there at that site. The problem with their cemetery is they're right on a coastal bluff, so they have a lot of salt damage, a lot of salt air that hits them. Um, with a leprosy colony, they've pretty much had to deal with what they had on site. There's not a lot of cargo ships coming in. You know, they can't run a hardware store. You know, they can't go down to Lowe's and buy materials to make a headstone. They can't place an order. So they've made everything on site by themselves. So they've made their own lime mortars. They've mixed their own concrete with the beach sand. And that's introduced a lot of salts. And salts are really bad for masonry. Uh, salts, as they dry and they get wet, they, the crystals inside them expand and contract, and that pushes apart um, our material. So to reinforce their, their concrete, they've used a lot of iron, uh, just scrap iron that they found on site. So all these makes for a really bad mixture, uh, a really corrosive uh, mixture. So they've been working a lot. Uh, the guys at HPTC have worked a lot to reset the fallen graves that have been blown over by the wind and uh, the occasional little earthquake or you know volcanic activity, that sort of thing, um, and really cleaned up the site. But as far as the headstones, that have a lot of the salt damage and a lot of the corrosion that way, uh, we're still working on getting a good solution for that. So those are still sort of lying in wait. They're, they're waiting for us to come up with good solutions um, on how to protect and preserve those. So a lot of them have been cleaned now, and that, that's helped a lot of it, uh, vegetation cut back, that sort of thing. So there's been significant improvements made, um, but there's still, there's still a lot to be done. That, that's quite the challenging uh, project. Yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, the site you're working at and, and what you hope to accomplish with it. site has a lot of issues. How many graves are there, that, marked graves that are still standing that you can, re, you can see? Yeah, probably about 50, 60, maybe more. So that's, that's a nice size site, yeah. Yeah, some of the gravestones have been moved from their original location. Um, they've been moved under trees, set up on the side. Um, I think some are even broken, aren't they? Like in half, broken. <laughs> yeah, we, we see that a lot, that graves get moved. Um, 
you know, even small sites or even, you know, large populated sites, as maintenance crews come and one gets knocked over, one lies down, and the, you know, the maintenance crew thinks, oh, you know, we don't want to hit this with a mower. We need to, to move this out of the way to protect the stone. And, and, and rightfully so, and, and the, the logic is good, but then it gets moved, and it gets moved under a tree where a mower's not going to hit it or our car is not going to drive over it. And if it stays there long enough, the placement memory is gone. The next thing we know, then, oh, well, there was all those people buried over there by the tree. And those get replaced and reset where we found them. And, and graves, graves, unfortunately, move quite often because of things like that. Um, so it's good, you know, if you can find some documentation that maybe lists, you know, where people are buried. Um, one thing I've had good luck with, not great, but, you know, it's a start, is... If it's a family cemetery, it's a family plot, looking for those last family members that are still around, sometimes it's not very often, but I have a couple of incidents, talk to them and you know, ask, well, do you have a family Bible? Can I see it? And looking in the family Bible, I actually have found when people died, but not only that, I've actually found once or twice little maps drawn by you know great-grandmother or something showing where people are in relation to each other. So it might not be a site map, but it may say, you know, Uncle Jenny's buried here and Uncle Tom is right beside her, right beside her. So we can sort of place where some of the graves are uh, that way. So that may be one aspect of research that you guys can look into, uh, you know, trying to find where some of those, you know, now displaced graves at the trees, you know, might be, have been located. All right, who's, who's going to be my last question? Austin has another question. All right, Austin, what do you have? Have you ever preserved a famous person's grave? Have I ever preserved a famous person's grave? Ah, you know, locally famous, but no, I've never anyone of any national significance. I guess the most famous graves I've ever worked on are at Congressional Cemetery. Uh, I was able, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, the Park Service and HPTC on um, the Congressional Cemetery Cenotaphs. And a cenotaph is a grave marker with no grave. So you have a marker, but someone, the person is actually buried somewhere else. So in Congressional Cemetery, we have cenotaphs to all of the members of Congress in the early days, so the early members of Congress who passed away while in office. And I was able to work on those and the U.S. Arsenal Monument. And the U.S. Arsenal explosion was the largest civilian casualties of the Civil War. And it was literally the, the arsenal that made the munitions, that made the weapon, um, the cartridges, the powder, things like that. For the Union Army, there was an explosion that killed uh, a, good, a large number of women and children that worked at the factory. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work on uh, that monument. And then at the same time, in the same project, at Congressional Cemetery, General Alexander Macomb, which is probably the only nationally significant person I've had to work, I've had the privilege to work on, and uh, Alexander Macomb um, was the leader of the army in the War of 1812. Um, I was the caretaker for a cemetery in Savannah that had a lot of famous people buried in it. If we have any Girl Scouts in the audience, Juliet Gordon Lowe is buried there, the founder of Girl Scouts. I never got to work on her grave because it's still family control, but I have repaired the fences on either side of her grave um, to beautify the, the general area. Um, and also I've repaired the fence uh, at James Pierpont's uh, grave, and his, he's best known for having written the song Jingle Bells. So that's, that's my claim to fame there. I've repaired the fence for the guy who wrote Jingle Bells. So a lot of local significant people, past mayors and, you know, uh, politicians and that sort of thing, but... Um, you know, uh, recently worked on the grave of uh, uh, John Sibley. Uh, Mr. Sibley was appointed in Louisiana, where we live. We have Sibley Lake, and there's roads named after him. But uh, more importantly, he was um, promoted by Thomas Jefferson himself to come down and be the Indian agent, the Native Amer what we consider now the Native American liaison. Uh, he was the Indian agent for the Louisiana Purchase. So significant uh, in, in history that way. So nobody real famous or really exciting, though. Sorry.
Um, and the last slide I've got is my information. Uh, and feel free by all means to contact me and shoot me an email. I, I answer emails well. Uh, it may take a few days sometimes because I travel a lot with my job. Um, but if you have questions, uh, feel free. I'm, I'm more than happy to help you guys with your project. So any last questions before we sign off? Nope, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Day, and, and good luck, uh, students. I hope your project goes really well. Um, and and I, I really commend you for taking the effort uh, to do such important work and, and to, to you know, want to get into this field. It's, it's very important. It's very important to, to remember um, our past. You know, the people who made our communities, the people who made our country are buried in those cemeteries. So it's very important to remember them. So I, I definitely commend you on uh, your future endeavors. So thank you very much. Thank you.